Okay, if you will, find your way back to your seats and find your way to Acts chapter 11. There are outlines tonight, and it would do well for you to have one of those. And don't lose it because we won't get through everything tonight, and next week you'll need it again. We'll have some fresh copies for a number of people who are missing. The next couple of weeks, I'm going to speak to you about the identity of Church Alive. The identity of Church Alive. Actually, we're a little different from another, uh, many other Western Christianity churches. Because as you're going to see from the scripture tonight, our primary goal is not to grow people and gather them in. We have such a desire to gather and, and grow people in, but we want to raise them and you up and send you out. Did you know you're the evangelism team? When's the last time you shared the gospel with someone? I don't share that for condemnation, but you're the evangelism team. I was uh, many years ago in view of a call, that's what they used to call it, and so I spoke at a church and they liked that and afterwards they asked me a bunch of questions and they asked me what my evangelism strategy was. And I said, well, my strategy is to equip you and get you praying for neighbors and work associates. I'm going to teach you how to share the gospel and reach people. And one of the deacons stood up and he said, well, pastor, what we want to do is hire you. And on Tuesday night, we were hoping you'd go out with and meet any visitors and share with them. Needless to say, I didn't want to go there and they didn't call me. Because the attitude of that is absolutely wrong. It's not that I can't go out and share, but we are to be sharing the gospel. For this church to grow, we have to become people who share the gospel. So if you're in Acts chapter 11, I hope you're there. Acts chapter 11, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 19. This is the church at Antioch. And I want to talk to you tonight and next week about the identity and purpose of Church Alive. Holy Spirit, would you be our teacher? Would you bring revelation and insight into these scriptures? And would you help us examine our own hearts before you? Are we doing what you have really gifted and called us to do? Or are we just gaining the knowledge and sitting and not doing anything with it? So I ask you to help us be those people who are living the faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews alone. At least they were evangelizing to the Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, so they sent Barnabas, his name means son of encouragement, off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. He was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left there for Tarsus to look for Saul, who we will know later as Paul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Christian means little Christ. They were so maturing and so walking in life and the ways of the Lord that people looked at them and said, you're just like Jesus. People are getting saved through you. People are getting healed through you. People are getting delivered through you. People are getting filled with the Holy Spirit through you. You're, you're Christians because that's really the definition of Christian. Now, at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine over all the world, and it took place in the reign of Claudius, Claudius, one of the Caesars. And in the proportion that day that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And they, this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. Would you turn to chapter 13? Let me read to you the first 
four verses. Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went. I'm going to stop right there. I was laying in a hospital bed in Victoria, Canada. I heard the Lord speak to me. There were several things that he shared. But it was with that internal, audible voice. It was so clear. He said to me, Church Alive is not like any other church in your region. I have specifically called her or you to be uh, a church raising up leaders and releasing them into my calling upon their lives. You are an Antioch church, a church with a womb. Then I saw a vision of a forest filled with trees. And I'm laying there and I'm looking and in the air I see this forest filled with trees. I mean, it's not just imaginary. I'm seeing this picture up, up in the, uh, the room above me. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, a forest filled with trees. He said, what else do you see? I was quiet for a little while and I said, well, I suppose it's filled with animals and creatures. There was a pregnant pause. It probably lasted a minute or so. He said to me, it's filled with lumber for houses, beautiful furniture, potential for so many things. Now, what do you see when you look at church alive? And I laid there and I brought as many of your faces before me as I could possibly remember and a number of those that are not here. And here's what I realized. About 75% of you are called to some sort of ministry or some sort of leadership or some sort of function. You're not called to just come and sit here once a week. This is the equipping center. This is where you are learning and growing up. And what the Lord wants to do is he wants to bring more people as we share and invite. But he wants us to then disciple them. And some of you, there are not enough jobs, if you will, in the function of the church. But we're going to talk about that. But he's calling some of you to start a prayer meeting on Monday morning, 30 minutes before your work week starts. He's calling some of you perhaps during lunch once a week to do a small Bible study. He's calling some to perhaps get involved in other care ministries and things going on in this community as we live the kingdom and as we share the gospel. He's calling some of you to start home groups. And some of you said, no, I'm too busy. We're going to talk about that. Because he spoke very specifically to me about some of these things calling some of you to hook up and be a part of a home group. He's calling some of you to get involved as a group and go do evangelism. Some of you began, and when you had some challenges, you quit. Can I just tell you something? The ministry of the kingdom at first is not easy. It's challenging because we're dealing with our flesh, and we're dealing with people who have flesh and they're demonized, and you're dealing with an enemy that's pushing against you. So this idea that God's called me to do this and I can step out and everything's going to be easy, you just forget that. Because it will not happen that way. I began to look around and see so many people. Some of them are not here tonight, but they're in Bible school because they want to be involved in full-time ministry. Some have said, man, we are watching and online training and things because we want more anointing as we minister to people. It's good. What happened over the last three and a half weeks before I came back is I had an opportunity to get renewed and a bit of refocus and recharged. And so the Lord reminded me of something. He called Mission I Hear the last day of May, the first day of June, 2001. He called us to plant an Antioch church, and it comes out of these scriptures. We grew for a while. Some wanted to change the name because we had a house of prayer that had a pretty significant number of live hours of prayer and some live stream that was being run. At one point, we were doing 60 hours of praise and worship and prayer and intercession a week. There were four or five ministries involved in that. We had a stream of business people, kingdom business people, and we met once a week for an hour and a half, 
and we would do an, about 45 minutes of praise and worship and prayer and get together, and we would strategize on how people in the marketplace, whether it was business or education or, or medicine or whatever, how the kingdom through their lives could be established where they lived and worked. And it was happening. Then we had a church family. But the mission didn't change. And I'm laying there, and the Lord spoke to me very clearly. He said, the assignment I gave you in 2001 has not changed, and I want you to go back, and I want you to proclaim this vision, and I want you to do it where I've placed you. What is an Antioch church? Let me give you a little historical background. Paul and Barnabas go to a church called Antioch. But there were a number of people from four or five countries that had heard the gospel. They were gathering there. They were sharing the Lord. They were teaching the scripture. People were getting saved, and not just a few or a few dozen, but considerable numbers were being reached and growing in the Lord, and perhaps they were outgrowing the maturity of the people that were leading that church. So God sent some people in to take over and say to those people, you don't have to do anything anymore. Not what he did. He sent in two men, Barnabas and a man named Saul, and he said, you equip these leaders and you equip these people to multiply the ministry. And that's what they did. For a year, they met with them regularly. That means several times a week they met for teaching. That didn't mean that twice a month people came to the teaching. It meant regularly, three or four times a week, they came and they were taught for a year. So as we unpack the Antioch church, they had a leadership team that met regularly to fast and pray and seek God's direction for the church. And these are their defining characteristics. There are six of them. Let me give them to you. They were a praying church. They prayed personally. They prayed in small groups. And they prayed in large numbers on a regular basis. I'll tell you what's in my heart. I want you to go to Acts chapter 15. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 15. I want to show you something prophetic that the Lord is doing in this last day. Because he says so. Acts chapter 15, verse 16 and 17. Acts chapter 15, verses 16 and 17. It says this, After these things I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from of old or long ago. What does it mean to rebuild the tabernacle of David, to rebuild its ruins and restore it? Why this is so important is the salvation of the Gentiles and the great harvest that God wants to bring in in the end time is attached to understanding the rebuilding of the tabernacle of David right there in the scripture. So some have said, well, well, it's not a place. Yes, it is. It has two places. First of all, you're a tabernacle of David. You're a place of his throne and his presence. But what God has been doing in the last 20 years around the world in a number of major cities here in the United States, but in a number of countries around the world, whether it came out of Kansas City, whether it came out of boilerplate or 24-7, or prayer rooms, or whatever, is he was establishing places specifically dedicated for people to leave the hustle bustle and all the stress of their life and to come from a wholly dedicated location to simply worship the Lord, minister to the Lord, listen, and to pray the things that God was revealing. I used to do something in Siloam. Please don't see this as arrogance. I want to say something to you. People will say to me, well, why do you have all this insight? And God shows you these things. And why do you do this? And why do you get to travel the world and you get to teach? Let me, let me tell you where it came from. For six years, we had a tabernacle of David. 
And I would take two times a week. And I would say to my staff and our people, unless somebody dies, if I'm in there for two hours spread out on a table, don't bother me. Now, I wasn't being mean. Man, I was surrendering. I was submitting. And I was saying to the Lord, I desperately want to hear you. What's on your heart? What's on your heart, not only for the church there in Siloam? What's on your heart for your people? What's on your heart for your kingdom? You're sending me to these nations. I don't know what's going on. i got to hear from you. I probably spent 10 hours a week in that house of prayer, but I had twice a week for a couple of hours where I simply dedicated myself to seek and hear the Lord and to open the scripture, not to find a message, but to hear the heart of God. And many messages came out of that. Much revelation and insight came out of that. And it came from the tabernacle of David. Let me explain. Don't worry if we don't get through everything tonight. There's next week. Bring this back. Here's what the tabernacle of David was. And you'll find it in 2 Samuel 6. And you'll find it in 1 Chronicles 13, 14, and 15. And you'll find some reference to it in 1 Chronicles 29. As they fasted and prayed and ministered to the Lord. And they burned hot before God. It's a dedicated place. When David brought the Ark of the Covenant back to the nation of Israel, did you know for 33 years it did not go back up to the plains of Gibeon in the tabernacle that God had given to Moses? Did you know that it sat out in the open for 33 years? God had David build a special tent awning. And he had a place toward the east end where he built a platform and they set the Ark of the Covenant in that place And he had them hire as people's full-time employment. It's right there in the scripture. Their job was to come and to praise and to worship and to give thanks and to minister to the Lord and to create an atmosphere where anyone in the nation of Israel could come at any time and come into the manifested presence of God because the scripture says that the Lord dwelt in the air above the mercy seat between, between the cherub's wings. Presence of God was there. When David says, I worship God in the shadow of his wings, that's not some prophetic metaphor. David would come in the morning as the sun rose on the east, and the sun came up on the Ark of the Covenant, and there would be a shadow from the Ark and the wings that would be in front of the Ark, and it would be the manifested presence of God. And David would come and lay on his face before God and say, I can't lead this nation unless you talk to me and you anoint me and you lead me. You see, that's how you lead a church. That's how you become the powerful people that God intends. 33 years, it's not a mistake. Jesus lived 33 years. And after those 33 years, when Solomon came and they built the temple, they put it back in the Holy of Holies, and the high priest went in just once a year until Jesus came and he tore the curtain from the top to the bottom. And he said, now the place of my presence is open to all. Of course you can pray. Of course you can have a prayer group in your home. But I can tell you what the heart of the Lord is, and that is to establish a place in northwest Arkansas that is holy and dedicated unto the Lord that may have several ministries and churches involved. And I'm praying for five or six organized prayer times, some in the morning, some at noon, some perhaps after work or in the evening. And there'll be different kinds of prayer Michael Bell, if you've ever been in one of those times, can take an hour or two and he just worships and he ministers to the Lord and he doesn't even know you're in the room. And I'm sitting there and the presence of God is just falling on me as I'm hearing from the Lord. There's praying the word where people have scriptures like you had tonight. And somebody's leading worship, and they come, and they pray that word. And sometimes there's a phrase out of that that the singers turn into a song, and we're singing intercession to the Lord. There are focused and dedicated prayer meetings. We had an hour prayer meeting every week for five years where about 20 people came, and we prayed for Israel. Because what does the Scripture say? We are commanded to pray for Israel and the peace of Jerusalem. Because in that peace of Jerusalem will come the Lord's return and our peace. So one of the things Antioch did, they were a praying church. And as they fasted and prayed and they heard from God, 
they were able to do what the Lord said, not because it was just a good idea, but because God spoke it and there was anointing of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know the difference between a good idea and a God idea? It's an extra O. Oh. We don't need any good ideas. We need God ideas. And they come from prayer. The next thing that the Antioch church was, it was a reaching church. They were reaching the lost. They were reaching the saved that were hungry to grow. And they were reaching those that God sent to get equipped. And we've had a smattering of that here, but God wants to do a lot of that. Okay? Preached at a church one time that was kind of a country church. Good church. The Lord gave me a scripture about the harvest and the grain. Now, here's the question I asked them that I'd like to ask you. Are you into the harvest? Are you in just to conserving the grain? We do a lot of grain conserving here. We take care of people. We help them get well and help them get whole. But as you get well and get whole, God does not want you to continue to sit. He wants to equip you and show you how to get involved in ministry, whether it's here or out there. And so I had a discussion because several farmers were sitting there, and they were growing corn, and they were growing wheat and those kind of things. And I said to them, you can conserve the grain, but if you're not focused on the harvest, what happens? And I appreciate it. They were willing to talk back to me. They said, if you don't continue to focus on the harvest, pretty soon you don't have any grain. Can I tell you why some people are leaving the church? They're bored. They're bored. Because just come, let's sing some songs, let's hear a talk, let's get a little of this, let's go and come do it again. If that's all you have in your heart, you've missed the whole purpose of the church. It's about coming and ministering to the Lord. It's about coming and getting healed and whole and getting equipped so that you can lead a home group, so that you can disciple someone one-on-one, -on -one, so that God may send you to the mission field. So they were a praying church. They were a re reaching church. They were a equipping church. The word equipping there, didasco, is the root in the Greek language. means to equip with knowledge and application. It's like apprenticeship. It's about learning, and then let's go and let's do it. Okay, so again, I'm not patting myself on the head, but there was a time when this man and I began to meet regularly. Pretty soon, another man and I wanted to join, wanted to join us. And I'm equipping him and I'm encouraging him because he is a gatherer and he has a teaching gift. Before long, I said to him, maybe a year, why don't you start a small group? And we strategized about the seven or eight people to invite, and he did, and God birthed it, and it happens every Wednesday. Okay? Because the goal, and I come some, I may not be able to make it all the time, but it doesn't matter because I'm not in charge. The Holy Spirit and Steve are in charge. See, the idea is that I wasn't just teaching him, I was apprenticing him so that he could step into part of the calling in his life, and it's just part of it. It's just an example, okay? So they were a teaching church. They were a giving church. They gave as a lifestyle. You give to your local church, thank you so much. You give to missionaries. Misha and I have supported eight different mission ventures every month for over 20 years. And we tithe, maybe 11%. Not bragging. I'm just telling you that I'm not asking you to do something that we are not well entrenched in what we practice. And then needs arise as the Holy Spirit directs. And we give some here and we help some there. How can you do that? Because for the most part, we got out of debt. And since I've been battling these sicknesses, we've been in and out of debt. And it frustrates me because when we were out of debt, we could do more. And so what I'm encouraging you to do is to ask the Lord for his plan in the next year or two to get out of debt. There's such freedom. Now, we haven't paid our house off. We have quite a bit of equity. But we were at a place a couple of times where we really didn't have any other debt. And the freedom... So I don't intend this to come across as braggadocious. I'm trying to say to you, 
we're encouraging you to walk in some things that God is teaching us. Okay? You still out there? You okay? Okay. So, giving as a lifestyle, and that's serving too. Sending at the Holy Spirit's direction. We've had times through the years where we've raised up an assistant children's pastor, and another church has come and said, you know, we are desperate for a children's pastor. Do you have anyone that you might loan us or give us? No, oh, because we're building our own empire, and this is all about us. When God said, um, that person you raised up the last 18 months, why don't you ask them if they're willing to go over here and be the new children's pastor? So part of my flesh said, But God said, you do know that when you obey me to give, that all I do is multiply your blessing. So you have to decide whether that's just words in a book or that's reality. Do you believe it or not? It's reality. They were a sending center. They were a resource center where people were raised up and plugged in. We certainly need some people plugged in here. But we also can become a center that sends out and helps in other places. What is the application of this church at Antioch to Church Alive? We're like a teaching hospital. One of the things that happened when we were in Canada at Royal Jubilee Island Hospital is that the head of internal medicine came in, Dr. Cox, and he was in charge of me, and, and I was so glad. What a quality man. But he introduced his, his senior resident, a lady named Dr. Rachel, and then he introduced two junior residents, and they all came, and they talked to me, and they all came, and they ministered to me, and they all came, and they helped me under his tutelage. And where we're going forward is this. If you want counsel from me, I'm probably going to have another man with me. And for some of you, like, I don't know if I like that. Well, God said we're a teaching church, like a teaching hospital. Well, I don't know if I like those that are younger. Can I just tell you at 30 years of age, I was pastor in a church of 300. And the only way I could do it because I was green and ignorant at times was by the anointing of the Holy Spirit and sometimes making mistakes and just apologizing to the body and saying, well, you just keep praying that I'll learn. We need to get over God using 20s, 30s, and 40-year-olds. It's his plan. We're like a teaching hospital. We have in our midst an apostle, prophets, pastors, and teachers, and I am praying like crazy that God will raise up a person or two with the office of the evangelist. We need them in our midst. We need them. We're a five-fold ministry with a womb. We help people get born again, build biblical foundations, grow up, and be released into their calling we are home base for many in the future. People ministering that are going to come and get refreshed and encouraged and go out and they need a place to come back. Can I tell you who some of the most discouraged people are that need encouragement? They're pastors and spiritual leaders. Now, it's a little unique because you seem to love us and you really encourage us and you really bless us and you take care of us. But I talk to many leaders that that's not their experience where they're ministering. Thank you so much. But we need to model that and be a blessing to those people. I want to ask Chris to come. Where are you at, Chris? So it was really fun. Yesterday he and Jess were out and about. And God really spoke to him. Friday. And if you want to grab the handheld there. And uh, he had quite a fun experience that I want him to share with you because I think the Lord is willing to do this more and more. Yeah, so uh, I was driving. I was actually going to meet Jess at Walmart because we had a couple of returns or whatever. And she just got off from somewhere and I'm coming from another way. So we're going there. So I'm driving on the way there, hit a light, notice this car in front of me. They've got their spare tire on. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. And I just immediately feel this really strong pull from the Holy Spirit saying, you need to help them. And I'm like, 
oh, okay, God, well, just to make sure it's you, if they pull into Walmart where I'm already going, and I know it's, it's silly, this is, this is the inner monologue that happens sometimes, and I'm like, all right, God, if this is, if this is you, another testing of God, but thankfully he's gracious. So get up over on Walton, and they get in the left turn lane for the light. So I'm like, okay. So I pull up a few uh, spots down from them. I walk up, chicken out, walk away. <laughs> I go inside, meet Jess. She has no idea. And I'm like, just in my heart, I'm just like, I have to do this. I, there's some urgency here that I don't understand. And I just hand my return to Jess. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go help these people that God told me to help. So I go walk over. And yes, it's awkward. Yes, I'm already slightly socially awkward. Imagine me just walking up to you and I don't know you at Walmart. But uh, I went and talked to him. And I'm like, hey, I don't know if you know Jesus, but he told me to help you with your spare tire and I want to buy you some new tires for your car. And they were so open and receptive. Turns out she had... uh, She's in between jobs right now. Um, they were actually, they've been driving on that for a while and they're waiting for their next check to get done. But I got to talk to them a bit and I got to share the gospel with them. And uh, please forgive me, I forget their names. Um, <laughs> but uh, the man I, I got to talk to and he uh, said he, he had gone to church before, but then I asked him kind of some more poignant questions of like, if you died today, do you know without a doubt that you're going to be in heaven? He's like, I don't, I don't know, honestly. So I shared him the gospel and I asked him if he'd like to receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And he said, yes. So we went ahead and prayed right there in the Walmart automotive section while we're waiting in line for some tires. Uh, His girlfriend at the time didn't, it wasn't ready to accept it. I did invite him to church so I hope if you're watching, please come. I'm not super awkward all the time. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but it was just a fun time. And they just, they just opened up and just told me just how, how nice it was for, the, for that to happen. I mean, they're like early 20s. And I remember when I was in my early 20s, I had no idea what I was doing. I was like the most childish adult in existence. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just once you, it's like once I walked up to them, it felt like the Holy Spirit's like, and now I'll take over. Like, and, and that's that step of faith we have to take. And I know it's scary. I know it's scary. But um, I just want to encourage you to take that step of faith. And, uh, and even if you haven't been getting those promptings, Maybe there was a time or two that you maybe didn't listen to God. I know I've been there. Sometimes he'll wait for a season. It's not that he doesn't love you or whatever. It's just that you needed some time. I needed some time to really understand some things that he revealed. And then he's just like, okay, here's another opportunity. And he he wants to trust us with that. Um, so if you've, if you've not been getting those promptings lately, I pray that you'd ask him for those opportunities because they are not, a, I mean, they're, they're not just only one or two in Northwest Arkansas. There's, the harvest is plenty, few are the laborers. So I just ask that you would seek God to bring you. Here I am, Lord, send me. And just, yeah, so. Amen. It's not, Good. Super crazy or whatever. It's Thanks, just, Chris. Yeah. Yeah, good. Amen. So what's the future hold for us? A couple more things I'm going to share, and I'll draw this to a close. One of the things that um, happened to me yesterday morning up early, just praying, and the Lord spoke to me. Read Matthew 25, verses 24 and following. So I open up there. Um, it's the parable where the landowner is going away for a long time and he gives five talents to one person, two to another, and one talent to this man 
according to their abilities. Sometimes people have said, well, why did you give one five? According to their abilities, their ability to be faithful and invest. Because sometimes we don't like this, but God is into return on investment. When he invests something in us, he wants us to sow it and put it to use for the kingdom. So he comes back after a long time. The person that received five turned it into ten. He blessed him and said, you're going to uh, rule over more in the days ahead. The two, he had four, blessed him. And the one said, I knew you were a hard man. He didn't have the right picture of God. And I, I was afraid. And you extract where you don't sow and you don't work. And so I buried your money and I hid it. See, he didn't use what God gave him. If you want to please God, you have to invest. You cannot please God without investing. Every one of us have gifts and callings. Every one of us have talents. And so I went on and read this passage, and it caused me to wince. And what I'm about to share with you is going to have a little bit of an edge to it. But those that had gifts and talents that did not use them for the Lord, he said, you're a wicked, lazy slave. If you have gifts and talents that you're not using for the Lord, He sees you as a wicked, lazy slave. Man, it's quiet. I didn't think about you first. I said, Lord, would you help me examine my own heart? And he said, you're doing things I've called other people to do. And I want you to go back and focus on what I've called you to do. It's about mentoring. It's about raising up. It's about equipping it's about launching and supporting. And so I, for one, am going to go back to primarily focusing 80%, if you will, because I know there's always a few things that we all have to do that aren't necessarily our giftings. I'm not ignorant of that. But then yesterday, I had a conversation with someone, and the Lord really spoke to me again. And he said, do you want to know why Church Alive struggles? I said, I do. He said, because so many people say no and they need to say yes. Can you help with the children? No. You see, if we were as concerned about our children's ministry as we are about our kids that go to Christian school and public school and go to their parent-teacher conferences and check in and make sure they're well-behaved and they're learning. If we were committed to do that with children's ministry like we do with public education and quit giving God leftovers or send them out there and let's... Something different might happen. We have some youth, some younger youth that God would like to birth for these four or five. Will you teach them? She's asked one or two, and they've said, well, I, I can't give you an answer or no. Would you be a part of a home group? I'm just so busy in life, I don't have time. No. That's where the community of believers takes place, where you get your needs met, where the fellowship's at, where you really grow. But for many, the answer is no. Would you start a prayer meeting at work? No, because I'm there, and I've got a pretty good position, and if they find out, they may judge me. Will you be faithful to church rather than once or twice a month? Will you be faithful? Well, sometimes our job is just such that we're so busy that we're just tired and we can't come. It's just another way to say no. And what I began to hear from the Lord was many people that are saying, no, 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 no. But we sure want to be blessed. And the Lord said, you need to challenge people to say yes, and you need to help them say yes because the success of what God wants to do here is directly related to you finding where he wants you to plug in and say yes and we will continue to struggle when the Lord prompts us and we say no and don't you yoke the staff with that because we are fasting and praying and we are working and we are reaching out and we are trying, and we get about three no's for volunteers to every yes. And the Lord basically said, the struggle is that people are saying yes to so many other things, but they're saying no to my church and my kingdom. 
That may be a little hard to swallow. But we are working diligently to pass the baton to these younger generations. And it's tough sometimes because they struggle and say no rather than yes. And yet I am praying that God will work in our hearts to be a people that say yes. Now, you can't say yes to everything. Don't do it. I understand seasons of life. I, I'm aware of a couple or two that both their parents are very ill and they're very plugged into helping them and they come when they can. That's a yes to God because we're called to take care of our parents in those situations. But I'm talking about situations where you're not using your gifts because of fear or a misplaced priority and the Lord is asking you to say yes and you're saying no will never be the Antioch church that God's calling us to be unless we become a people who say, yes, yes, find your place. Not only in this body, out there. Let me close with a story. It's so funny. I, I, I was so shocked. Uh, Chris shocked me out of my shoes. We were with him last night, he and Jess, and Ron and Lena. And he's been taking some of my stories, they're short, maybe two or three minutes, and posting those on the website, and I told a particular story that got a thousand hits, and I was just shocked. Because I do a short, I do a particular vlog every week, and sometimes I get 70 or 80 hits. And if you're interested in a little 15-minute encouraging or challenging teaching, I do it almost every week, and Chris posts that toward the end of the week or early the next week, and um, I believe it'll encourage you. So I want to tell you a story. How many of you know Diane Brass from Global Seed Planners? You remember her. She's the storyteller lady. We support them on a monthly basis. Um, great ministry. So I serve on their board. She called me a couple days ago and she said, Pastor Tony, I have just got to tell you something marvelous that God is doing. She said, I can't hardly contain myself. I said, well, Diane, share with me. What, what's going on? She said about two years ago, our staff and our leadership team began to pray and say, Lord, we want to go places where they've never heard the name of Jesus. And we're working in Muslim countries and Hindu countries and atheist countries, and, and we're working in that 2050 window where there are few reached or little reached, but she said, we have a desire, Lord, to work where they've never heard the name of Jesus. And so the Lord opened up a door two hours north uh, in upper Pakistan, mid-central north Pakistan, two hours above where they caught Osama bin Laden in a place that is so Muslim and so demonic and so resistive. And the Lord said, there's a name, of, there's some people there called the Gallo people. And I want you to pray that God would raise up a couple from Pakistan. And he made provision to support them, 200 a month, and and that couple uh, identified, and they sent them in there with training, and Luke 9 and 10 says, when you go into a place that's never reached, you're looking for a home, and you're looking for the man or the couple of peace. You're looking for those people who will receive you. And so they went in, and after a little while, this couple embraced them, let them stay there, helped them get established, and they began to share the gospel. At first, the people were afraid because they were so heavily Muslim the women were still cloaked up and, and considered less than, just so many things, but they brought the freedom of the gospel. It took over a year before they had their first convert couple, this couple of peace. Over a year. And so then they began to pray because there was such poverty and such brokenness amongst these people, and they began to share and they were having some of these kind of like secret meetings where they might have a dozen people and people were open to the gospel, but they were just terrified because if it got out, they would be beheaded or killed. I mean, we're talking some pretty rough places. And so Diane and the team began to fast and pray. And this is the direction of the Holy Spirit. I want you to give every family in that village 50 pounds of food beans and rice. And so there were about 50 families in this village. There was something like 250 or 280 people in this village. 
And so Diane found the food. They, they took the step of faith. I think it was about $10,000 to buy it and get it there. But they first went to the chief of the village and a couple of elders and said, this is what we'd like to do. We would like to bless your people with 50 pounds of food in each household. And the chief and the elders said, well, that's amazing. So the food came, they passed it out, and this is what happened. See, this is all about people that said yes when it was difficult. That's why I'm telling you this story. They didn't say no. They said yes. And it was challenging. They passed it out. And the chief called them in along with a couple of other people. This is what he said. We've been praying for years to Allah and he's done nothing. And Isa came. That's the name for Jesus. And he answered our prayer and he fed our people would you tell me about Isa? Today they have 50 converts in the village Amen. after two years. And this is what's happened. Some of the converts have been taught. And they came to this couple. At this point, Diane's fighting back the tears. And she said, and a couple came to them and said, how can you prepare us to go to the next village and tell them about Isa? That's the heart of people that say yes. I want to ask you, will you become a people that say yes? But I'm afraid. Do it afraid. I don't know how to do it. I have vision. Come talk to us because we'll walk beside you and we'll help launch you. But it's not okay if you have gifts and callings and desires to sit on those because I already told you what the Lord thinks of that. And it's not good. Why don't you stand? Some of you said, we're really glad you're back, are you? I love you dearly. But it's not okay just to be sitters and getters. We've got to become yesers and ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? See, what the house of prayer did for me was this. It's the end of 2 Corinthians 3. It's about beholding and becoming. Beholding and becoming. And as I beheld him and as I heard him and I became more and more with faith what he asked me to do, even though there are times when it was the risk of faith, I stepped out and watched the Lord do many things. And he said, thank you for obedience. Here's some more. Because what it says in that story, to the one who doesn't have, even what he has will be taken away. And give it to the one who has. And it's like, well, that's not fair. Only if you're in a pagan, ungodly culture. What you've got to understand is, if you're doing something that's fruitful, God wants to bless that because he wants more fruit. We're talking about people getting saved. We're talking about people getting equipped to go to these villages or whatever it is. And so my appeal to you, brothers and sisters that I love, find your gift and begin to put it to work. Say yes, let's pray. Father, we love you. We, on one hand, are weak in our flesh, but I believe your word that we're mighty in you to the pulling down of strongholds, that the anointing of your spirit can take us in our weakness and make us bold and wise and strong and effective. And so we say yes. We quit saying no. We say yes. Lord, would you help us with our fear to step out in faith and be risk takers? Would you help us with our misplaced priorities instead of giving you the middle or the leftovers to seek you first in your kingdom and Lord, if we need to curtail a little bit of work, can we trust you to bless those work hours because we're honoring you as we walk in integrity, but cutting a few hours to serve you specifically, would you prove to us that you're able to more than make up for that? May this become a place of people who are getting equipped and finding a way to say yes, and you are using fruitfully. May we behold you and become 
and step into it in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. I'll finish.